All right. Okay, so that's all. Okay, you guys start. I'll let you know. Because we have a long semester, we're only about halfway through. So we're going to use, you know, what we talked about on Tuesday to see if we can actually translate some, you know, basic C code into assembly code. In other words, we'll all become, you know, human compilers. So we'll take a look at you know, some of these um, instructions. We'll start with some simple ones, and then we'll work our way up you know, to more difficult ones. Um, this is kind of, kind of com coming from the older notes. Uh, let me point out <coughs> where you should look you know, for the more updated stuff. They're all still valid, um, but you might want to start with the newer stuff, you know, which are control structures. Um, as far as jump instructions are concerned, we are almost completely done with uh, jump instructions. So we're going to finish this topic first today, and then we'll move on to uh, control structures. When I talk about control structures, I'm talking about conditional statements and loops. Okay? In C, you have the pre-checking loop, which is the while statement, and then you have the post-checking loop, which is do while. I call it post-checking because you perform an iteration before you check to see whether you have to go back and do something again. Okay? So we'll go ahead and get started with um, conditional branch because last time we talked about uh, conditional branch, I wrote a very simple program, but I did not test it last time. Now, in addition to this entire bunch of conditional branches, which only rely on one single flag to determine whether to branch or not, we also have some instructions to rely on multiple flags to determine whether they should jump or not. Um, let's go through each one of these, you know, one by one, <coughs> and then we'll make sure that you know we can handle these um, all together. Uh, JC jump if and only if the carry flag is <coughs> set. So the question is, if the carry flag is not set, if it is cleared, what are we going to do after the JC instruction? What do you think? Continue. On. Continue with whatever is following the JC instruction. Exactly. So it works for pretty much all of these. You know, some are really just the inverted version. This is jump if and only if the carry flag is not set or cleared. Um, this, is, this one applies to the overflow. These two apply to the sign flag. These two apply to the zero flag. All eight of these only rely on one single flag to determine whether to branch or not. Okay? So these are fairly kind of obvious because we talked about all those flags already. These ones down here, they rely on at least two flags. Okay. In other words, they all use more than one flags to decide whether to perform the jump or not. Okay, let's take a look at the first one. Jump if and only if, quote unquote, less than. Now, whenever we use L and G, those refer to signed comparison. When we use B and C, those refer to unsigned comparison. Um, a also, so A, B, C are unsigned, and then J, um, G, and L are signed. Okay, so that's one quick and easy way to remember. All right, so let's take a look at the first one first. Jump if less than. Okay, last time we talked about how <coughs> we can determine the ordering of numbers if you compare numbers in a signed way. Do you guys still remember that? Okay, so the indicator is the result of the exclusive or of the sign flag and the overflow flag. If sign, exclusive or overflow has a result of one, that means the second operand, excuse me, that means the first operand is greater than the second operand um, when interpreted signed. Okay, so I'll just go ahead and write it down even though I just said it. And occasionally I can still remember what I just said. <laughs> Not all the time. Okay, so we basically say, you know, compare instruction like this, you know, CMPL. Um, I'll just use registers. You know, it doesn't matter what is in the register, but in this case, uh, EAX. Okay, so in this case, um, EAX, let's see, the first operand is bigger than the second one. So EBX is greater than EAX if and only if um, overflow exclusive sign is 1. Okay? Because the compare instruction subtracts the first operand from the second operand. Okay. So in this case, the comparison of the, the so-called less than is referring to the fact that EAX is less than EBX. 
I know it reads kind of funny because we are reading the first, the second operand. How we are, we are, the the relationship is is with respect to the second operand to the first operand. Are we still doing okay? Yep. So it's subtracting e a x from e, or it's comparing e a x to e b x. It's subtracting e b x from e a x in this case. Okay. This one it subtracts. EBX from EAX. But it doesn't store the result. Okay, the result is not stored because this is not SUBL, this is CMPL. So the result is not stored, but it goes through exactly the same motion to change the four flags that we talked about. So are we doing okay so far with this? So how do we know this is exactly how it is doing the comparison? Well, let's go ahead and run some experiments, right? That's the easiest way to double check to make sure that you know, this is all consistent with the actual instruction set. So let's go ahead and use one of the terminals. Make a directory for today's class. All right, so we'll go ahead and just write a very simple program and we just call it you know, signed compare. And we'll use exactly this particular case. We want to make EBX greater than EAX, but only when interpreted signed. Okay, so that's the that's the other tricky part is you know, are we looking at things from the signed perspective or the unsigned perspective? Um, to make that happen, I just have to make EAX smaller. Um, I'll move negative two into EAX, move negative one into EBX, because in this case EBX is one larger than EAX because they're both on the negative side, then we do a compare long, EBX, EAX. And the rest of the program is not really that important because you know this is all that we want to do. We want to find out what how the flags are affected by the compare long instruction. So the rest of it, you know, I'm just putting it here just to be consistent, but it's not really important because I probably don't even you know finish the program or the execution of the program. Just like that. Okay. Go ahead. It will take either one because you know early programmers you know made that spelling mistake, and they cannot change the assembler to use only uh, the one with an A, because doing that will break old programs. <laughs> so you, you can use either one, you know, global with an A or without an A. They're both just just as good. Okay. And this is not an English class. <coughs> I really need to talk about the make file first, you know, so that so that way I don't have to deal with this myself. All right, so we have GDB up and running. Uh, I'll just put a breakpoint on the very first instruction, um, which puts uh, negative two into EAX single step. Take a look at EAX, and it does have a value of negative two. You can also see in hexadecimal it is represented as FFFF. FFFE, which makes sense because um, it is two steps away from zero in the op in the negative direction. Because one away from zero is FFFF, FFFF, so FFFF, FFFE are two, is two steps away from zero. And therefore it represents negative two. And then we want to look at the other one, IR, oops, we have the single step in the second instruction, and then we can look at EBX. EBA has a, has a value of negative one, which is FFFF, FFFF. Okay. Are there any questions at this point about these two numbers? No questions? Okay, so now let's go ahead and try to predict what flags will be cleared and what flags will be set after the compared instruction itself. Um, if you subtract negative one from negative two, what do you get? You get negative one, okay? Except in this case, you know that is not stored, so that means the sign flag is going to be it's set, right? It's a one. Um, how about the Z flag? The Z flag should be off, right? Zero. Uh, what about the overflow flag? 
should be cleared because the sign makes sense. And what about what is the last one? Carry, carry. carry flag. What about the carry flag, which in this case is the the borrow flag? We are subtracting E B X from E A X. Um, but remember, when you look at the borrow flag, it is seen from the perspective of um, unsigned comparison. So should the borrow flag be set or clear? Is there a borrow? No. That should be a borrow because I am subtracting F F F F F F F F from F F F F F F F E. Okay. So let's 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 take a look. Let's see whether you know that's the case or not. Single step, and then we look at E flags. That you can see the carry flag is set, the sign flag is set, the overflow flag is cleared, and the Z flag is cleared. Just you know, kind of as we predicted. So that's good. Do we have any questions about this one? No questions? Okay. So let's go ahead and change the program just a little bit. <clears throat> let's see what happens when I change this to a one, okay? Assemble, relink, and regdb. Put a breakpoint on line four, run the program, single step, single step. And this time we want to look at EAX and also EBX. And you can see that they are just as predicted. Okay? EAX still has a value of negative two because that's how we initialize it. And then EBX has a value of one. Now this time, how do you think the flags will get changed? What would be, is there any change from last time when I performed the compare instruction? If so, you know, what is the change? Which flag is different from last time? Overflow? The carry flag is the only one that gets changed. Because in this case, we are subtracting one from FFFF, FFFE, but since the, the borrow flag is seeing things from the unsigned perspective, FFFF, FFFE is a really huge number. It's four billion something, right? We are only subtracting one from it. So the borrow should not be triggered. So that should be the only change from last time. We'll single step the compare instruction and then look at the, uh, the flags. E -R I R E flags. And sure enough, the carry flag is now clear. The sign flag is on because um, the result is negative three and it is you know, on the negative side. So the sign flag is still on. Uh, over flag is off because the sign makes sense. Uh, Z flag is off because the result is non-zero, and then the borrow flag is cleared because in the unsigned interpretation, there's no need to borrow. Are we still doing okay so far with the flags? Okay, all right, that's that'll be helpful. And if you remember the homework assignment, you know this should be helping a little bit because I think I just worked out two pos two cases for you for your homework assignment. But tech, this, these are all 32-bit numbers. My homework assignment is supposed to deal with 8-bit numbers. How do I make the change? I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> There's no need to say anything. Okay. I, I, think most of, I think all of you is getting the idea how to make this work with your homework assignment. Don't say anything. <coughs> all right. So in this case, if I use JL, would it branch or would it not branch? Remember, the L less than is taking the sign flag and the exclusive exclusive sign and the overflow flag into consideration and make an ex exclusive or out of those two. If the result is a one, then it will branch. So in this case, do you think it's going to branch or not? It should. Because the sign flag is on, the over flag, overflow flag is off, so the exclusive OR of those two flags would be a one, and as a result, JL would actually branch. Okay. So what that means is, if I want to write down, you know, what JL is about, JL to a particular label L1 means branch if and only if um, sign exclusive o, uh, overflow is one, which is basically what I said earlier here, but this is more specific to the JL instruction. 
Is that okay? All right. J and L is easy, right? J and L to L1 means pretty much the same thing, except you know we are looking for a zero out of the exclusive or operator. <coughs> are we still doing okay? Let's take a look at G, uh, JG. Okay, JG to L1 means what, what does it mean? It means in this case, you know, if I just keep using the same compare long uh, compare long instruction. In this case, JG means EBX um, is less than EAX. All right. So what do you think would be the flag combination that I'm looking for? Well, first of all, isn't that the same thing as JNL? Jump if and only if greater than. Isn't that the same thing as jump if and only if not less than? Almost. <laughs> the Z flag, exactly. The Z flag has to be taken into consideration. Because J and L simply means not less than, right? Not less than can still be can be equal to. Greater than means they're not equal to. They cannot be equal to. Okay. So now that we know that the meaning is EBX is less than EAX, I would just kind of go back and change the direction of the comparison because that really is the proper way of looking at it. So I'm going to just flip the direction. You know, I'm not changing the meaning, just you know, changing how it is represented. Okay, there we go. How do we express this you know, using a Boolean expression? Exclusive or, and, or, negation, and stuff like that. Okay. The first one is pretty clear. Okay, the first one is you know we want the sign exclusive or zero. I mean the uh, ex exclusive or overflow to be a zero. Okay, so we want that to be. Sh we want that. But we also want one more thing. What and what else do we need? And not Z flag. When, and the Z flag has to be clear. So those are the two things you know joined by a conjunction. In other words, JG, unlike JL, is actually looking at three flags and not two at the same time in order to determine whether to branch or not. Are we still doing okay? okay. JNG, you know, well, I should say the entire result has to be a one in order for the branch to happen. So JNG is pretty easy to explain because you know that really is to say it will branch if and only if the entire expression gives you a zero in the end. Are there any questions about JG and JNG? No questions about these two? All right. There's one last one, which is JA and JNA. JA to L1 means um, EAX is quote unquote about, that's why, you know, that's why the A, EBX. Now when we use the word about, it always is interpreting, interpreting in an unsigned way. Okay? So the question now is, if I look at it from the, from the flag's perspective, what does it mean? It will branch, you know, when the flags give me a value of one. But what is the expression? Now, JB can be interpreted as, you know, jump if the borrow flag is set, but you can also say jump if below, okay, from the signed, uh, unsigned perspective. So JB is jump if below, and jump JA is jump if about. So in this case, the first thing we are looking for is the borrow flag has to be clear, or the carry flag has to be clear. But at the same time, I don't want them to be equal because above implies you know, they are not the same. So that's why we are also looking for the case where z equals to zero. So when this entire conjunction itself is true, a one, then we do the branch. Is that okay? Uh, next word again. We want carry to be clear because you know if, if carry is a one, that means it is below. That means EBX, EBX is below EAX. We want E uh, 
um, we want, no, excuse me, I think, I think it's back. If the carry flag is set, it means EAX is below EBX. We want EAX to be above EAX, so the first thing we want to say is it is not below. But just saying it is not below, which is the same as JMB, is not enough because they can still be equal to. And that's why we need the second condition of the Z flag being zero, which means they are not the same. So this way we are saying, you know, um, EAX is not less than EBX, and EAX does not equal to EBX. That together means EAX is greater than EBX, but interpreted uh, unsigned. All right, and then the last one is JNA. JNA is relatively easy to explain once we have you know, JA explained, because it simply means you know, the entire expression gives you a result of zero. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. The next, so this is all great. We have eight basic conditional branches looking at you know, just one of the four flags. And then we have these six additional conditional branches, each one taking a, lo a look at two or more flags. And they can do you know, basically all the combinations you know, that you really can think of when it comes to comparison. What about a risk architecture? What do you think is the bare minimum for a risk architecture to deal with when it comes to flags? Less than hmm? less than equal. Less than equal and unconditional. Those are the only three that you need in order to implement the rest. I think just less than is enough already. Okay. So let's go ahead and take a look at something else. You know, you will see this as trivial, okay? So forget assembly language programming for now. What if you are only given the less than you know um, symbol in C programming? Can you implement all the other <coughs> comparison operators using less than and uh, logical operators. Logical operators means you know and or not. Okay. Yes. The answer is yes. Okay. So let's try to look at all of these. A is less than B. Well, that's an easy one. You know because you know, A is less than B is already using less than. There's no no need to change anything. A is greater than B. Flip the order. Right. <coughs> How about A is less than or equal to B? It's the same as saying what? It is not the case that B is less than A. Does that make any sense? Okay. Um, the other one is really easy because it really is the flip side of this. So I'll write it out anyway. Let's try something that's difficult. What is that? Uh, not A greater than B, not B greater than A. Perfect. What about this? A is different from B, right? Less than greater than means you know not the same as or different from, and you know, which is basically saying A is less than B or B is less than A, right? Okay. A does not equal B. A does not equal to B. Same, same, same thing as exclamation point equal in C and C++. I'm using less than greater than because that's actually used in all the other languages. <laughs> all right, there's only one left. Equal. In C, A equals B. So how do we represent it using only less than? If not A equals less than B, then not B is less than A. Yep, that's it. Up. Sorry? Yeah, no, yeah we, we mixed those up. Which one? Uh, the last two. The last two? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's why the, uh, that's, there's a reason why the other languages use less, they all use less than greater than to represent not equal to. It's because it is the same as A is less than B or A is less than or greater than B. That's why they use that particular symbol in um, 
SQL, you know, SQL or Visual Basic, I think they use this. Does it use that symbol in Visual Basic? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Now, when we translate this into assembly, let's see what we can do with this. Okay. So we have, you know, the same comparison instruction, EBX and EAX here. And we'll just go ahead and use and say interpret as unsigned numbers. Okay. I want to implement, okay, let's say, let's assume only JB and J and B. JB is enough. Only JB is. CMPL, JB, and unconditional branch jump are available. Okay. So the next question now is how do we implement all of the other ones, all of the other variants using only these three instructions? Okay, so let me, how do we implement the following? So I'll just use one particular one. Um, jump if and only if a equals b. I don't even give you, um, in this case, I don't even give you the z flag. We only have the carry flag. But first of all, is it possible? It should be possible because you know, earlier we showed that you know, given only the less than operator, comparison operator, we can implement equal to. So we just have to do pretty much the same thing, but this time using assembly language instructions to do the same thing. Okay. It doesn't matter which way you, you <coughs> which one you compare first, because we know that we have to compare it you know, one way, and then we have to compare it the other way to confirm that they are in fact the same. Okay. And so you know, in this case, should I use a J and B here, or should I use a J B here? So I would say jump to L1 if and only if A equals B. All right, so what are you gonna do here? What do we do next? After we compare EBX to EAX and you only have access to the carry or the borrow flag. You have to jump to another compare. Mm -hmm. You have to jump to another compare. When do you jump to the other compare? If, if it's uh, below. <coughs> if it's below, you jump to the other compare? Check to see if it's less than. It's, uh, if it is, then you jump to the other one to check to see if it's less than. If you switch. Okay. I would do it in a slightly different way. I would use you know, this. I would use you know JB to another label, not L1. You know I have to invent another lo label called L2, and L2 is my exit. Okay. Does that make sense? In other words, if I compare EBX to EAX and I confirm that EAX is below EBX, I'll just go ahead and continue with whatever is after it. Right? That preserves the same meaning as jump to L1 if and only if A equals to B. Because as soon as I confirm that you know, A is less than B, that means they're not equal. So I can just you know, go and say, okay, well, you know, I guess we won't have a chance to jump to L1. Let's just continue execution with whatever is following this chunk of code. Is that making any sense? Okay. What does it mean? Now this is a particular thing that I always do, at least when I'm writing my own programs, is after a conditional branch, I use a line of comments to remind myself what does it mean if I fall through the execution and end up executing the instruction right below a conditional branch instruction. So in this case, if I continue execution, that means I have just confirmed one thing. I just confirmed that EAX is not below EBX, right? So I'll just write that confirmation here. EAX is not below EBX. Okay. EB, EAX is not below EBX does not automatically mean that um, EAX and EBX are the same. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, since I cannot use the Z flag, I would have to compare again. But this time, you know, change the ordering of the comparison. 
So I'm going to use CMPL again. I put EAX first as the, sec as, as the first operand and EBX as the second operand. And then I will say, well, if the result of this comparison indicates that EBX is below EAX, guess what? Branch to L1 as well. Now, in this case, there are two ways to do it. The more optimal way to do it is simply to say, um, if I can confirm that EBX is not below EAX, that means they have to be equal. Because earlier, we already confirmed that EAX is not below EBX. Now we have confirmed that EBX is not below EAX. So that means they have to be the same thing. Might as well just go to L1 at this point. If the result has a carry flag getting set, it will just kind of fall through this and continue on to the label L2 to continue execution with whatever is after this chunk of code, which is basically what is what is the same thing as you know jump to L1 if and only if A equals B. Is that doing okay so far? You know, just at least the rationale of this code. This can be implemented with you know CMPL, EBX, EAX, JZ to L1. So basically I'm saying you know if I don't have you know JZ, I can use this chunk of code to do exactly the same thing. It is certainly cumbersome, but it can get the job done. Are we doing okay? All right. Now this is a, you know, just an exercise to see how we can combine the compare instruction with conditional branch and also unconditional branch instructions to simulate the effect of you know, some you know, kind of compound conditional branch instructions. Are we still doing okay so far with these? Okay, kind of. <laughs> okay, so assuming that we are okay with these, um, we have, oh, here are the ex expressions. You know, these are the actual logical expressions of what we just talked about earlier. And this part talks about how you know, a CISC architecture, like the I386, gives you every single possible combination as a single instruction. Whereas a RISC architecture will probably give you some, but not all of the combinations, because you know, the less common ones can always be done using a combination of conditional branch and unconditional branch instructions. And therefore, you can save silicon. In you're just you're just making your program a little bit longer, which is less expensive in terms of you know the hardware side. All right. And what about the others? I'm not gonna you know give you guys these guys. You know, uh, okay, I'll I'll go over it, but we'll never use it in this class. J C X Z means jump if jump if and only if C X is zero. This instruction combines the testing of CX, which is a register, uh, a 16-bit register, and the condition of the jump you know, at the same time. Um, it definitely is a macro instruction. In other words, it's just combining a few instructions into one to save um, the number of lines in the program. Uh, it's basically the signature of a sys architecture. And I don't think we really have to talk about this because um, very few architectures has instructions like this. The I386 has one, um, but if you look at the ARM architecture or the AVR architecture, those are all uh, RISC architectures. They don't have anything even close to this. Okay, and the same thing applies to the other ones: J, E, C, X, Z, loop, loop, Z, loop, E. They're the same thing because E and Z are really the same thing. So we will, we we know that these exist, you know, so that just so that you know that you can use these instructions. But we are not going to use these instructions in this class. Right. So now that we have put all of these out of the way, okay, going back to um, the class note here, topic four is done. And we are now moving on to topic five. Now topic five is going to take well, maybe not a whole lot of time, but it will take a little bit more time. Because this time we are looking at control structures. And I have to find out which one is new and which one is not. This is, a, this is the new one, that's the old one. So you want to go to control structures one, which I think is a better explanation of the same concept. If one is not clear, you can always refer to the other one to see if the other one is more clear. But I think you know, this is a newer version of the two, and it does a much better job of explaining everything. Okay, purpose of the module is to, uh, con how to convert a C program, or the control structure of a C program, 
into assembly language. But we want to do it step by step, very mechanically, so that you know you don't have to kind of think in your head, okay, how do I approach this? You know exactly what to do. It, it's a very step by step approach. All right. So this is you know the um, the approach. We are only going to deal with these three. In other words, we're not. I'm not going to deal with switch or the for statement. Does anyone want to kind of guess why I don't want to deal with the switch statement? It's just a bunch of ifs. Yep, it is if, else if, else if, else if, else if, and then else. Okay, if you have a default. Um, what about for? For is the same as a while, except the post operation is also specified on the same line as the condition and also the initialization. So it just makes all the things that are related on the same line. But in terms of the actual control structure, it's nothing more than initialization, while, condition, post, operation, and then end the loop. So structurally speaking, it's not that interesting. It's not different from just a while loop with certain features. So that's why I'm not going to talk about it. All right. Let me explain the approach here using this one, you know, because the, the note is really, really terse. So I will go ahead and explain you know, how to read this note here. This is the general uh, high level conditional statement that you, regular, you usually use in C and C++. I'm not going to talk about the case where there's no else because it's really it's a special case. Um, basically, if you don't have anything to do in the else part, you can always just say block two is empty, right? How many people, you know, just habitually you know, put in the else, even if there's nothing to specify for the else? How many people always put in open curly brace and close curly brace, even though there's only one statement to specify? <laughs> because if you always use curly braces, you know, even though there's only one statement, that makes it very easy to add another statement and not mess up the logic of the program. Now, with C programs, now this part obviously has nothing to, to do with assembly language programming, but down the line, you know, for you know, for those of you who will write, you know, a lot of C programs, you you just have to be careful because if you have a, a statement like this, if some condition C, you know, you have you know a particular statement to execute. In this case, statement is a simple statement, assignment statement, or a subroutine call. Okay, this makes sense, right? Okay, you know, it, it makes perfect sense to me if condition C is true execute statement. Okay. <coughs> but let's say later on you find out that, oh, guess what, I got some other things, uh, another thing I have to do, another statement. Okay. So very naturally, we just go here and say, use the same indentation, now I have a second statement to perform um, when condition C is true. But this is not, it looks like what it, it looks like it's going to execute statement and statement 2 when condition C is true, but it's not. Because statement two is not a part of the conditional statement anymore. In this case, statement two will execute regardless of C. But it's syntactically correct. The compiler has no way to guess that, oh, you mean that statement and statement two should execute only if and only if C is true. Nope, the compiler sees this exactly the same as what most people would write as this. Right? So that is why I always use curly braces. So in this case, even if I only have one single statement, I will do something like this, which seems to be a waste of you know, lines because you know I have one line for the open curly brace and one line for the closed curly brace. But if I do it this way and I do have one additional statement to perform and I add it up and I add it to the code like this, there's no confusion. It is definitely within the conditional statement in this case. Visually, it is in, and the compiler sees that as a part of the conditional statement as well. Is that okay so far? Now, I always, always put in the, the else to, even though there's nothing to do, and then have just open and close curly brace, because in case I do have something else to do, or something to do when the condition is false, I know exactly where to put it. Because if you don't do it that way, and you have a lot of you know, nested code in between, you might have a hard time to find out your where to put that else or where, what that else is corresponding to. Just minor tips that I pick up, you know, as a as a programmer myself. And you know, if you think this is useful, use it. If you think this is all baloney, just kind of ignore that. 
<laughs> because different people code differently, and you obviously you will have you will have your own way of writing your code. Okay, so getting back to our main topic here. This is a general template of a C conditional statement. You have a condition to evaluate. It either evaluates to true or false. If it is true, you want to execute block one. If it is false, you want to execute block two. The next thing I want to do is I'm going to change the structure of this code into some really ugly C code. In other words, this logically this is, logically is the same as this. So let's try to look closer here and see whether that claim is true or not. Okay. What do you guys think? In this version, block one executes if and only if condition C is true. If you look at this block one here, does it execute if and only if condition C is true? Yes. Okay, so that part is okay. What about block two? Block two here executes if and only if condition C is false. You look at this block two here, does it execute if and only if condition C is false? Yes. All right, so in that case, this code here, which is very clean, elegant, and the way that done the way that uh, you know any C instructor will want you to do it, is it's really equivalent to this really ugly code because it has go-tos and labels. Because you know, remember the G word, you know, is taboo in regular type of programming, but in assembly language programming, you don't have a choice. You have to use go-tos. So we are actually transforming a program step by step from what you usually use in C and C++ to a form that is closer to something that we can actually implement in assembly. What? Do we have something similar to, you know, if not C, go to some place? I mean, does this, have we talked about any instruction that resembles the meaning of this line here? Sorry? Well, not compare and jump, yeah, but conditional branches. Conditional branches does exactly that, okay? Except in a conditional branch, the condition in assembly is very simple. Is the carry flag cleared or set? Is the zero flag cleared or set? Is the overflow flag cleared or set, right? But nonetheless, from the control perspective, it is structured exactly the same way as that, okay? You have one condition to evaluate, it determines whether to go to a particular label or continue execution with whatever is next to it, following it. So structurally speaking, that resembles a JC, JL, JG, JE, JZ, and so on and so forth. And that's why we are doing this. We are, we are trying to break down a regular C program into a form that is, you know, that we can use assembly building blocks to implement. And in this case, you know, I also explained if you don't have an else, in other words, you have a simple conditional statement it just translates into this, okay? And that's only because I'm optimizing these two instructions. You know, going to the label that is right next to the go-to itself <coughs> is you know, just a waste of cycles. Do we have any questions about the transformation of conditional statements? Can you do an else, like hmm? go to nothing, or? You cannot go to nothing, but you can certainly have no block to here which basically means you're going to label L2, but you will continue execution into L2 anyway. And that's why you know, I'm just quote unquote optimizing the go to L2 out of the way, so the program is more efficient. But you cannot say go to and then not specify the destination. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so yep. go to L1 and then it says you know, block one. Mm -hmm. Is that essentially saying that block one is in the label of L1? No. If you look at this code here, this line means you know if condition is false, if C is false, go to the label L1. But it doesn't have an else part, which basically means you know if C is false, then this is tr oh, wait, okay. C I is take true. it back. If C is true, this one is false, then it's not going to go to L1. It will fall through and execute block one. Okay, so it's going line by line. Just exactly. Can you set flags manually, or um, do you have to set them mathematically, like CMPL 5 equals 5? And there and then might be instructions to force a flag on or off. I do not know for sure. Um, certain flags I know for sure, because if you want to set the zero flag, 
you can always compare a number to itself. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Um, so you could use uh, Jay Z, say uh, uh, CMPL five x five. Now you can do a Jay Z. So you don't even need con uh, the unconditional branch. Right. Right. Yeah, but most you know even uh, with risk architectures, they have an unconditional branch. You know because the the, the use of silicon in that case is so little compared to the benefit of having the unconditional branch instruction. Question? Yep. Uh, does the GoDaddy have to be in the same line as the if statement? No, does not. Okay. Remember, this is C code, so the entire thing can be on one single line, and I think the C compiler would be just as happy. Okay. <laughs> does make reading it a little bit more difficult. <laughs> So you can actually you know, join all these lines into one single line. You know, as long as block one itself is really just one single statement, hey, no problem. You know, it can all be on one single line. <laughs> and I have seen programs like that. You know, it's really hard to read. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> all right, next slide. The next slide transforms a pre-checking loop because you're checking the condition before you perform the action. It transforms a pre-checking loop that is really clean and nice and you know basically consistent with the requirements of all your high-level programming classes into something that is really ugly but means exactly the same thing and it still compiles in C and C++. Okay? So let's take a look at you know the meaning of a while loop. The meaning of a while loop you probably know already is when the condition is you first evaluate C in this case, which is an expression that evaluates to either true or false. If the expression evaluates to false, you just get out and continue with whatever is next to or following the while loop. If the condition evaluates to true, you execute block one. But after you execute block one, you have to go back and re-evaluate condition C, and then you just keep doing this until uh, C is false, then you can get out of the loop. So you translate it into this code here, this code starts with a label L1. Well, okay, we're just defining a place so that we can, you know, continue execution at that point later on. So by, by itself, L1 colon has you know, very little meaning. But the next line is basically saying, oh, if I have a reason to get out of the loop, let's do it now. That's basically what it's saying. And that's why you have to invert the original condition here to not C, because you're not looking for a reason to stay in the loop. You're looking for a reason to get out of the loop. And go into L2, L2, well, this one should not have a colon here, should have a semicolon instead in terms of syntax. L1 is right after the unconditional branch script going back to L1, so that really represents the continuation point following the loop itself. If condition C is actually true, that will make not C false, which also means I'm not going to go to L1. In that case, I continue execution with block one, whatever it is, and then after block one, I go back to label L1. Label L1 is up here. That means I will go ahead and re-evaluate <coughs> condition C to see whether I have to exit now or continue another iter continue for another iteration. Okay. So does everybody see the equivalency between the clean version and the really ugly version in C and C++? Now this transformation works just fine when you write your program in C and C++ because it is syntactically C and C++. But in terms of the structure, the second version, the one that is highlighted, resembles more of the structure of assembly language instructions that we have talked about. Conditional branches and unconditional branches and labels. Okay. So we are you know, continuing to kind of break down cons uh, constructs that we know in C and C++ into something that is more familiar when we get to assembly language programming. The last one is um, less often used because um, we don't really use post-checking loops you know, that often compared to pre-checking loops, but it's really the same thing. In fact, this one is actually simpler compared to a pre-checking loop. Because in this case, we perform the operation first and then we check the condition, but the condition, in C at least, is the reason to stay in the loop. So that means if the condition is true, you go back to the point before the block one, before block one, and then you perform another iteration. And that's why this one is actually a whole lot easier to translate compared to the other two control structures. Do we have any questions about the transformation from conditional statements, pre-checking loops, and post-checking loops into something that is ugly, 
but in terms of control structure, it's not structured anymore. Any questions? No questions? OK. So the next question, or the next thing we have to deal with, is what about C itself? In all three cases, C represents whatever condition you can specify in a conditional statement, in a pre-checking loop, and a post-checking loop. But C can be awfully complicated in C, because you can use um, conjunction, disjunction, you can use negation, you can use all those operators nested in really nasty ways. So how do we deal with that? How do we break down conjunction and disjunction and negation into something that is more elemental so that eventually they will all boil down to simple comparisons that we know, deal with, we know how to deal with? Okay? So that's the next question. Or the next slide or next section is going to deal with that. From the previous section, if a condition involves negation, disjunction, or conjunction, we must ta first take care of those operators. So this is how we deal with it. Not is easy. If you have a not C here, okay, if this is the original code, it is equivalent to this code here. Okay, let's see if they, they are actually the same. The first one says, if it is not C, you go to L1. This one says, if C is true, you go to L2, which continues ex execution. The only chance you will have to go to L1 is when condition C is actually false. So functionally speaking, this code is implementing exactly what this code is specifying, except we don't have the negation in anymore. Now negation is kind of a special case, because usually we can take care of negate, negation, the not operator, using um, you know, tricks that we know with comparison. Like A, it, it's not the case that A is less than B, is the same as B is less than or equal to A. Okay, so that way we don't have to go through this type of mechanical translation. Even in other cases, when you have a conjunction or disjunction involved in C, you can use De Morgan's law to get rid of the negation without making things more complicated like this. So this one is only used when it is not convenient or impossible to use those other tricks. For instance, if C involves you know, the, inv the invocation of the calling of a subroutine, then you cannot simplify it because you don't know what a subroutine is doing. So in those cases, you actually have to do, with something, do something like this. And you know, well, I, actually, you can still do something about it because you can change the comparison of the return value of the function. So you can still do something about it. So this is a rarely used uh, transformation. Does everybody know what is D. Morgan's law? No. Okay, let's talk about it. Forgot. <laughs> Sorry? I knew that. I forgot. You forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I think people who took CISP 300 from me should know about it because you know, that's something that we covered in that class. How many people took P300 from me? Do you guys still remember? Nope. <laughs> 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 All right. Okay, so let's talk about the Morgan's Law. D. <laughs> Morgan's Law. Okay which is a very useful transformation. Um, for programmers, it is useful, but it is even more useful for electrical engineers and also computer engineers. Because when they are dealing with things at the gate level, this is actually a very useful thing. Okay, what it says, there are actually two things that De Morgan's Law says. The first one, okay, so we'll, we'll mark it as the first one. The first one says, if you have a negation on the outside of a conjunction, you can transform the whole thing, and it will preserve the meaning you know, when you re-express it as not A or not B. Okay? That's one of the applications of uh, De Morgan's Law. Does it make sense intuitively? <coughs> sort of, right? But how do we, just because it makes sense intuitively doesn't mean it is true. To prove something like this, we can use a truth table. So we'll go ahead and use the truth table technique to prove this. All right, to use a truth table, we need four columns in this case. Because we have two independ independent variables, A and B. Independent means you know, when A is true, B can be true or false. There's no function, there's no tie between the value of A to the value of B. When A is false, B can again be true or false. So there are four possible combinations. A and B 
are the inputs. So now we want to look at the outputs. If A and B are both true, what is the expression? What is the output of this entire expression? False. False. Okay, false. Okay. What if one is true and one is false? True. 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 Okay. Now we look at you know, what we claim to be equivalent to the first, to the second last column. Okay. Because our claim is this is really the same thing as this. So now we want to take a look at this one. Okay. That will be false. What about this one? True. 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 And also true. So that means, you know, even though in this case we only have four possible input cases, and for every single case, the first expression is equivalent to the second expression. And therefore, we have just proven that it's okay. Whenever you see something like this, you can rewrite it as something like this, and vice versa. Now, in terms of electrical and computer engineering, this is useful because it means whenever you have a conjunction, you have a way now to transform that into a disjunction. Because certain type of programmable logic only gives you a certain type of gate. Okay? Uh, when I talk about programmable logic, it means I mean a CPLD or FPGA. No, FPGA. Yep, FPGA. Uh, CPLD stands for Complex Programmable Logic Chip, I think. Um, and then FPGA stands for Field Programmable Gate Array. So all of, both of those things are basically a single chip to implement uh, logic functions. But the logic function can change without desoldering the chip. They can be reprogrammed you know, on chip. In the case of FPGA, it can be programmed on the fly when the, when the device itself is powered up. In the case of CPLD, it has to be programmed by a special header and a special device so that you know, it can, it, it's not designed to be field programmable. And that's why FPGA is called field programmable gate, uh, uh, gate array. Now these things are very common on you know, all kinds of chips, you know, especially on motherboards and you know, graphics you know, uh, boards and stuff like that. Because you know, it's us usually used to implement what we call glue logic, okay? little things that have to be implemented in order for an entire board to function as a whole. And if you make a mistake with the equations, with an FPGA or a CPLD, especially with an FPGA, you can actually upload a new firmware and get it fixed. So that way you don't have to recall the parts back or you know, have, to, you know, have the customer to do a you know, special type of programming. You just upload the new code to it and the logic gate will do something different, or something that is correct. Okay, so the second version of this is really the flip side of the first one. If you have a negation outside of a disjunction, then it's the same as not A and not B. I'm not going to prove this one. I'll leave it up to you guys. Okay, but it's basically the same thing. You know, it still works, except I think this one has false, 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 true. You know, as the the values on each column, but they are equivalent. Are we still doing okay so far? How is that useful for us? Remember what we are trying to do here. When we see the negation in front of some condition, if I don't apply any special tricks, I have to do this. Now that I can apply this special trick, if whatever the C is, is a conjunction, I can now break it up into two smaller expressions. Each one is a negation. And then we have a disjunction in, the, in between. We don't have to complicate the code unnecessarily. That's the, the value of the Morgan's Law in this case. We still do okay? okay. Later on, we'll use an example to illustrate it. Next, when you have or, this is how you do it. C can be a very long and complicated expression, same with D, but if the disjunction is the last operation of this condition, then you can break it up and say this statement is the same as these two statements. Does that make sense? If C or D go to L1, isn't that the same thing as if C go to L1, if D go to L1? Isn't that kind of also highlight the short circuit logic that uh, like C follows? Yep, this also has the same property as uh, short circuit evaluation. Yep. 
which is which is good because we want our assembly code to resemble the behavior of the original C code, and this one does. Because that also shows us that uh, OR would operate faster than AND. No, the AND has its own short circuit. <laughs> oh, that's true. Right. Okay, so is that okay, the disjunction? So what we have done here is to make the expression simpler because originally it is it has a disjunction at the cost of making the program slightly longer because now we have two conditional branches instead of one conditional branch. But our objective is to make the expression so simple it is only involving you know simple comparisons. That's the objective, is to boil everything down to simple comparisons at the end. All right, so there's only one more, which is and. So in this case, if C and if C and D go to L1, it means if C is false, don't bother to evaluate D. Just go to L2 already. If we if C is true, then we'll fall through and then we'll evaluate D. If D is also true, then we go to L1. So together, these three lines will implement the same logic as as this one line here and we are converting something that has a conjunction into two things that do not have a conjunction. Now one does have a negation, but remember what, we, what I said about negation, most of the time it can be simplified out without complicating the code itself. So are we doing okay so far with the reduction of an expression into simpler expressions at the cost of you know, additional instruction, additional branches? Right. So now we have all the pieces. We really do. We have all the pieces needed in order to convert just about any C conditions into, you know, into a form where we can actually convert it into assembly code. Okay, very easy to convert into assembly code. <coughs> so this one talks about you know how we can do simplification sometimes. It is not the case that X is greater than or equal to Y. We can simplify to X is less than Y without complicating it. If we have X is less than Y or X is greater than Y, we can simplify that to X does not equal to Y. So that's, you know, that's basically what it's saying is sometimes you can ap apply. This is what we call, um, in compiler terms, it's called peephole optimization because it's very localized. So you're looking at a very tiny piece of code within the program and you say, hey, I recognize this bigger thing to be equivalent to this smaller thing here. And you just apply the transformation right away and apply, and so the code becomes more optimized. All right. Are there any questions before we move on? How about an example? Might be helpful. Okay. So we'll start with. Oh, let's see here. So we'll start with something that looks like this. You know, th for those of you who took uh, CP CISP three hundred from me, you will find this one to be familiar as well. So we'll say if W is less than or equal to X, and W is less than or equal to Y. Do you guys want me to use strictly C code or you know just any pseudo code and I'll just use the C code. All right. So I'll just make something simple for now, you know, because I don't want to make things too complicated. So we want to see how we can convert everything all the way down to simple comparisons and you know, the conditional branches that we just talked about. The first thing we have to take care of in this case is the conditional statement itself. Okay. So the first thing we want to do, the first revision is to say if it is not the case that this is true, go to L1, and L1 is here. It marks the exit point of the conditional statement itself. If I don't go to L1 because that condition turns out to be true to begin with, then I will go ahead and implement you know, Z gets the value of W. Are we doing okay so far with the first revision? Okay. I'm going to use a horizontal line to separate the revision here. So we can see the step-by-step -step transformation. Okay. Now we can concentrate on 
this particular part because it has a conjunction. And we don't have conjunction in assembly language programming. So we got to get rid of the conjunction. Oh, actually, I take it back. We have to take care of the not first because the not or the negation is the outermost operation. So we have to take care of that one first. All right. In this case, can I apply the Morgan's Law? We have a negation on the outside, a conjunction in the inside. Yep. It fits the pattern, okay? So we can apply the Morgan's Law. The Morgan's Law is basically going to apply the negation to each of the conditions. But the negations of the conditions, I'm going to use extra parentheses to be clear, will use a disjunction to connect all of those. So we had three. There we go. Go to L1. W, that one is over here. So what I just did was just to apply the Morgan's Law to transform something that has a negation on the outside but a conjunction in, in the inside into two simpler things. Each one has a negation, and the two things are now joined by a disjunction, which is the application of this one. Are we doing OK so far with the association? It'll I'm applying something that I was just talking about earlier. All right, so the next one is we have to take care of what is the outermost operator now? Or. The OR, okay, so we'll take care of the OR operator here. The OR operator can be taken care of you know, by breaking down the, a single conditional statement into two. Each one will go to L1. So this time, I'm just going to be a little bit lazy by copying and pasting. The other one is comparing to y, to L1. If I, oops, cannot use L1 anymore. I'm going to use another label. No, it's, okay, this one is correct. This is L1. And then we perform z equals w, and L1 is down here. Is that okay so far? Now we have to deal with the uh, negation. In this case, I don't have to go through the mechanical transformation because it is not the case that w is less than or equal to x. It's really the same thing as saying w is greater than x, right? Mm -hmm. So we can just you know, do that transformation here and just say if w is greater than x, go to L1. The second one is if w is greater than y, go to L1. And then we can, if I don't go to L1 because of both of these conditional statements, then I can say Z gets the value of W and fall through to whatever is after that. Okay, so this is, this is the end, okay? You know, there's no more we can do to make this any simpler because any simpler is already in assembly language programming. Can I transform the first one into assembly? Like if W is greater than X, go to L1. Is that easy to transform into assembly language? Relatively. I mean, it's a comparison followed by a conditional branch. Okay. So let's go ahead and push this all the way into assembly language code. Okay. We'll take care of one at a time. So we, I'm not going to deal with both at, at the same time. We'll take care of the first one first. Um, there's a trick to do this, okay? Now, because the i386 is a CISC architecture, it gives you every single possible combination of greater than, less than, equal to. Let's make use of that, okay? So I'm going to make use of you know, that particular feature of a CISC architecture because you can always transform that later on from a CISC you know, perspective to a RISC architecture. So for now, we will just kind of make use of the CISC you know, feature. All right. So how do we write this code? Now there's a template that I can teach you, and it's going to be useful. At first, it will look kind of, kind of counterintuitive, but later on, it will be kind of obvious and go, oh, okay, now I can, I can do it. Okay, so we know there's a compare long instruction, and we'll just specify question mark question mark here, and then we know there's a conditional branch instruction after that to implement the actual go to, and I'll put a question mark here and only specify label L1 because we know this is the structure of the code to replace this one here. Okay. The rest, I can just copy and paste because I only want to deal with one at a time. 
So how do we specify you know, all these question marks? There's a, there's a tricky way to do it. The tricky way to do it is you want to reverse the order of the, uh, of the operands. So the two sides of the comparison, you want to flip it. So x is the second one in the C code. You want x to be here. W is the first one in the C code. You want it to be the second one. Then you can actually preserve the operator. In this case, this is greater than. If it, this is a signed comparison, you just use G. If it is unsigned, you use A. Okay. Are there any questions about this transformation? The way you read the assembly code is a little bit kind of strange because this is basically saying jump to L1 if and only if W is greater than X. That is the order to read it. Crisscross. <laughs> you guys want me to do it again? Yes? Okay. Okay, well, I'll do this one, one more time. The way to read this is to say jump to L1 if and only if W is greater than X. Sorry? Can you put that in a comment? Say again? Can you put that in a comment? Can I put it in the comment? Yeah, like I it. Sure. <laughs> I, I can remember this stuff. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this is jump yeah, to yeah, L1 if and only if W is greater than X. All right? But you really have to do it a few times to really get used to the, the pattern of reading it. But once you get used to it, you know, it's, it's really useful. Because you know, this class will have a lot of code like this you know, in the near future. <laughs> All right, so one more step, or two more steps we're done. Um, the second one is to take care of you know, this part here. Okay, so we'll just copy the entire program and only replace that part with assembly code. So this one is CMPL blah blah J blah to L1. Okay, so according to what we just understood, it is jump to L1 if and only if W is greater than Y. I can do this because I've you know, done this many, many times. Then we have no need for this C statement anymore. <coughs> Is this program looking more and more like you know actual assembly and language code? Yeah. So we only have one thing left to deal with. Can we do that? I mean, you know. No. Okay. I'll, I'll I'll finish this part and then you know and then I'll explain why it is not really done yet, but it's pretty close. Okay. In this case, you know. Which one should be my first operand and which one should be my second operand using the move L instruction? <coughs> because the second operand is the destination, so you have to flip the order. So we're done. Almost. <laughs> well, I said almost because it depends on what uh, X, W, X, and Y are. If those are all memory operand, this won't work. Because remember, in move L, compare long, add, subtract, all instructions, you can only have up to one memory operand. And all of these have two memory operands. So what are we going to do? Move things into registers. Move one of them into a register, right? So let's see, which one should I move into a register? It's kind of obvious. W. W, exactly. Because if I move W into a register, I can reuse that for all of these little operations. Okay, so last revision, move W into a register. I'm just picking EAX in this case. You can pick some, uh, some other registers as long as it's not being used at the time, you know, it'll be fine. So the rest of it is really the same thing as what we already have. You're just replacing all references to W to EAX because EAX is now the same as W. So now we have the actual code implemented in assembly code. Yep. So why can you only have one memory operand? It has to do with the restrictions of the instruction set itself. But more importantly, it has to do with each instruction execution cycle 
can only have one memory cycle. So you can either use memory as a source, you're reading from memory, or you can use memory as a sink, which means you are writing to memory. But you cannot, in this very same instruction, have memory being used in both cases, both reading and writing. Okay. That's, a good, that's a good question, but it's an inherent um, limitation of most architectures is, you know, when you have two operands, only up to one can be a memory operand. All right. So we're done with this one. Mm, I'm just trying to evaluate whether I have enough time to finish another one. Can we get a copy of this text file? Absolutely. As long as I save it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You guys remind me to upload it and have it. You can have it. I thought I created a folder. Yep, it's right here. And we call it this. It's just text.txt. It's just you know, the t whatever text I type during the class. Capture.txt, if you will. Okay, so I want you guys, this is a brain teaser. Don't turn in anything. I'm not going to grade it. But I will talk about it next Tuesday. So I'm going to give you the code, and you can think about it and see if you can do it. Okay. So I'm just going to give you as x gets you know, zero to begin with, while x is less than three, it will take y equals zero two. Uh, y gets y plus x. X gets x plus one. That's the entire program. Very simple C program. You know exactly what's going to happen to Y. I just want you to think about how to translate this into assembly code. So you just have to apply what we learned today. The comparison is not even challenging in this case because we're comparing X, which is a variable, to a constant. And the ordering is already set up just right. So you don't have to deal with it. You know, like, oh, I have to put money to register. That nah, you don't have to do it. But the ordering is important. Okay. Um, I think this will be a good one to test. You know, it's, you know, it doesn't have any conjunction with this junction, so it's simple enough to get your, you know, um, skill up a little bit. Are there any other questions? You know what? I forgot one thing. I forgot to give you the answer to the previous homework assignment. The flags homework assignment for add instructions. I'm assuming. I'm assuming you're not trying to be tricking us on that wild line with the semicolon at the end of it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> now that turns it into an infinite loop, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. That's the beauty of C. You know, it's like you know one little semicolon, and I mean, it's still syntactically correct. It is. That it is, is the problem. It's, it is syntactically correct, and yet you know the behavior of the program is not quite what you think it is. That's that's why I wanted to clarify before. Very good. Good idea. I mean, you don't even want braces after the. No, you do. They wouldn't hurt. You put a semicolon after the while loop, <laughs> which yeah. meant the while loop executed no, no statement, but it continued to check X. Every it continued yeah, to check X. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I mean the the, the curl is always coming. Yes. Well, yes. It really? just won't do yes. what you yeah. think it does. While as if they only want a statement after that, and it's that's great. why if you only have one statement. All right. <laughs> so I'll be over at the lab if you want to answer questions. Are you safe? Save that. I say I say the I say the correct version is semi Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah.